In this video, there's a minimum of 75 Bible verses with prophecies and Bible codes that prove a flat geostationary Earth. I've grouped most of these verses into groups of three, so I'm going to be counting down from 25 to 1. It'll make sense to you in a minute. Uh, and I've saved the best two for last. So let's start with some easy ones. Number 25, Corners. Isaiah 11, verse 12 four corners of the earth. Revelation 7 verse 1, four corners of the earth. Revelation 20 verse 8, the four corners of the earth. You can't have corners on a sphere. That's because the earth is not a sphere. It's flat. Number 24, still earth. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16 verse 30, the world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Psalm 96 verse 10, the world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. Psalm 93 verse 1, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. It's all consistent, clear as day. If the world isn't moving, then it's not spinning and neither is it orbiting around the sun. Number 23, pillars. 1 Samuel 2 verse 8, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. Job 9 verse 6, and the pillars thereof tremble. Psalm 75 verse 3, I bear up the pillars of it. There's nothing about a ball-shaped earth that you can fit pillars into. That's because the earth is not round, the pillars hold up a flat earth, there's a dome on top, the earth is flat. Number 22, the firmament dome. Isaiah 24 verse 18, for the windows of heaven are opened. It's a dome over a flat earth. Isaiah 13, verse 13. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble. If the heavens can tremble, then it has to have solidity to it. Genesis 1, verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. It's a dome over a flat earth that separates the waters above the dome. I read this so many times and I didn't see what was going on. I read the word firmament, didn't understand it, but it makes so much sense now when you take it literally. Strong's Concordance defines the word firmament as a solid expanse, roughly like the domed roof on this building here. Here's the inside of that dome, and the stars that we see in the sky would be fixed into this solid firmament. And the whole thing rotates around a flat, stationary Earth. That's why all the stars move around the sky together as one set piece because you can only have a solid dome separating the waters above from the waters and seas below on a flat earth with the atmosphere in the middle it doesn't work on a ball shaped earth number 21 the firmament dome continued Isaiah 44 verse 24 I am the Lord who made all things who alone stretched out the heavens who spread out the earth by myself well, you can't spread something out by rolling it into a ball. Uh, Psalms 18, verse 9. He bowed the heavens also. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, verse 10 repeats Psalms. It says, he bowed the heavens also. Strong's number H5186 describes the word bowed as bend. The heavens bend around us. It's a domed heaven around a flat earth. Number 20, the sun. There are 67 Bible verses that reference the sun moving. You can easily look this up. Uh, here's a title on one website that lists them all. But zero, zilch, nothing, no Bible verses at all that ever make reference to the earth moving. So at the very least, the Bible supports a geostationary earth. Number 19, Bible codes. If you're familiar with Bible codes, then you'll know there's a matrix of flat earth clusters from Luke 13, verse 28 to Luke 14. Here's the matrix. Here's flat, earth, and an equidistant letter spacing. You'll also find dome, canopy, tent, truth, edge, disc, even, and a lot more. If you don't have Bible code software, then you can do this for free at BibleCodeWisdom.com. Number 18, height and depth. Job 11, verse 8. It is as high as heaven. What can you do? Deeper than hell. What can you know? 
So there's a height to heaven and a depth to hell. You can't have a height to heaven on a heliocentric, ever-expanding universe model. You can only have a height to heaven on a flat earth that has a dome over the top of it. Number 17, length and width. Job 11 verse 9, the measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. It doesn't say longer than the sphere and broader than the curved ocean. You can't have a length and breadth on a ball unless you change the wording of the Bible to accommodate it. You can only have a length and breadth on a flat level plane. Number 16, wisdom. Colossians 2 verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. 1 Timothy 6 verse 20, false science. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. A ball-shaped world is wisdom to those that live in the world and get their information from TV or the education system. Uh, wisdom of a global earth is literally foolishness with God. True wisdom is not taught in the education system, and neither will you find it on the 6 o'clock news. True wisdom is only found by carefully weighing up the options, and that's what we've been doing on this channel for the last few months, weighing up the evidence. Really try to understand what the Bible is saying here in these three verses, because it's telling us that the earth is flat, it's not round... Number 15, day and night. Job 26, verse 10. He has compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Well, that's interesting. Here's a flat earth map. The outer bounds are made of ice. The waters are literally compassed with an ice boundary. The sun goes around the earth like this. Both day and night can only come to an end where day and night meet the dome. Beyond the dome, time ceases to exist. Whoever happens to live in that realm outside the dimension of time, beyond the dome, uh, which is the heaven, is also immortal. He's always been there. He can see the beginning and the end. Prophecies in the Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit show us the future is already foretold. And when the Bible talks of the everlasting, that's the place we all go to at some point. Problem is... Most of us who reject the truth will face everlasting shame. Like it or not, we're all going to meet our maker someday. So day and night can't possibly come to an end on a ball earth model. That's because the earth isn't a ball, the earth is flat. Number 14, Foundations. Job 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. As we've just seen, the foundations of the earth are pillars. Isaiah 48 verse 13, my hand also has laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. If the heavens stand up at his command, then it's telling us here that the heavens are a dome, it's a solid dome, the earth is flat. Number 13, footstool. Isaiah 66 verse 1, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Matthew 5 verse 35, he's swearing, nor by earth, for it is his footstool. Acts 7 verse 49, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. This is what a footstool looks like. It's got four pillars. Here's another one. How exactly are you mistaking this for this? What footstool spins at a thousand miles an hour? Number 12, Desktop Globe, Exodus 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath. Isaiah 42, verse 8. Neither my praise to graven images. It's also the second of the Ten Commandments. So that rules out having a spinning globe on your desktop, because what's a spinning globe? It's a graven image that depicts the earth. Why was the commandment not to have those things? Because it indoctrinates without even speaking. The earth isn't a globe, it's flat. Number 11, the stars. Matthew 24, verse 29. The stars shall fall from heaven 
Mark 13, verse 25, and the stars of heaven shall fall. Revelation 6, verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. We've all been brainwashed into thinking the stars are massive and trillions of miles away. The Bible is telling us the stars are not massive, they're small, close, and they're going to fall to the earth. So the universe that we see up there is dome-shaped and small enough to contain all the stars that circle around the flat stationary earth. Number 10, the universe. This is the ancient Hebrew view of the universe. We've got the earth on pillars, Sheol down there, and a dome over the flat geostationary earth, and all the stars and the sun and the moon inside the dome going around the earth. That's why in Genesis 1 verse 14 it says, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, not orbiting a Milky Way galaxy, no, inside the dome, the firmament. Number 9, Sun Circuit. Psalm 96 verse 10, the world also shall be established that it shall not be moved, King James Version. Equally, that verse could support a ball-shaped earth, but it eliminates the possibility of the earth going around the sun. Bear that in mind for a moment. Psalm 19 verse 6, talking about the sun, his going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit until the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. If the sun has a circuit, then the sun is not the centre of the solar system, as we've been told. Critics will say, ah, yes, but the sun is on a circuit. It circles the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. Well, if the Earth is established that it cannot be moved, but the sun goes around the Milky Way, then the sun would fly off away from the Earth and we'd never see the sun again. So when the Bible talks of the sun having a circuit, it's talking about the sun circuiting around a flat earth. Number eight, circle of the earth. So those who loosely read the Bible point to Isaiah 40 verse 22, which says, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And they use that verse to support a round earth. But there is a difference between a sphere and a circle. Isaiah knew the difference between a ball and a circle because he describes a ball in Isaiah 22 verse 18. So why did Isaiah not use the same word for ball when describing the earth in chapter 40? That's because the earth is not a ball, it's a flat disc shape with a dome on top and pillars underneath. Number 7. Grasshoppers Psalm 33 verse 14, from the place of his uh, habitation, he looks upon the inhabitants of the earth. You can't do that on a 13.8 billion light year across the universe. It's a dome. Isaiah 40 verse 22, it is he that sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. If you're outside the expanding heliocentric universe, then we wouldn't resemble grasshoppers. The entire galaxy would resemble a speck. It's a dome over a flat earth. Number six, deception. Matthew 24, verse 24. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Ephesians 5, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. So, if you are deceived about the ball-shaped earth, thinking a sphere is the truth, then you've got no chance of ever being able to understand the Bible, yourself barred from all knowledge. If you take the view that the flat earth is a distraction, then what exactly is it distracting you from? What, celebrity gossip? Uh, or if you believe it doesn't matter if the earth is round or flat, then you're a self-confessed idiot, because it absolutely does matter if the earth is flat or round. You'll never be able to understand the Bible at all if you think the flat, round earth is a distraction or doesn't matter. Number five, tent. If we go back to Isaiah 40 verse 22 and expand on it, it sa if you remember, it says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. Here's a picture of my tent. I went camping in it a month ago. How exactly are you confusing a tent, a dome-like structure, for an expanding universe 13.8 billion light-years across? They don't match up. Again, 
this verse gives credence to the fact that it's a flat earth with a dome-like structure above. Number four, ends of the earth. Job 37, verse 3, and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. Daniel 4, verse 11, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Proverbs 30, verse 4, who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you can tell? <laughs> wow. Wow. Proverbs is Old Testament, and what a prophecy that is. Not only is it predicting Jesus, the Son of God, but also the ends of a flat, level earth. There's no end on a ball-shaped earth. It goes around continuously. You can only come to an end on a flat, level plane. Number three, lies. Jeremiah 16, verse 19. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth, and shall say, Surely... Our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. This is a future prophecy following a monstrous destruction of people who believed lies. But it could just as easily apply now, today. Here we are today showing evidence of the ends of the earth, telling people the earth is flat, and the generation who lived from the 1930s until now got lied to. The generation above us inherited lies, and those who stand for nothing will believe anything. There's no end to the earth on a ball. That's because it's not a ball, it's flat. Number two, the four winds. The Bible is consistent all the way through from Old to New Testament that there's four winds. For example, Jeremiah 49 verse 36, four winds. Daniel 7 verse 2, four winds. Matthew 24 verse 31, four winds. Revelation 7 verse 1, four winds. If you've got understanding, you'll know there's a jet stream that connects North America with Europe. Commercial aircraft try to fly in the jet stream to conserve fuel. Do some diligent research and you'll find there's um, four jet streams, two in the north and two in the southern hemisphere. So how did the guys who penned the Bible know about these four jet streams when they were only discovered in the 1920s when planes could finally fly high enough to discover them. So we have a dome-shaped earth that requires uh, cross ventilation. Okay, so here's an example of cross ventilation. Here's my here's my boiler in there and you've got to have two ventilations uh, one at the top and one at the bottom. It's not sufficient to just have one because that wouldn't circulate the air through. You've got to have uh, two for sufficient ventilation. If you want to properly ventilate your roof to prevent dry rot or wet rot, you'll need a minimum of two vents, one here and one here. But if you want to ventilate the entire earth, then you'll need inlets of air and outlets. That's why in Revelation 7 verse 1 it says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth, or on the sea, or on any tree. And the picture you see on screen is a graphical representation of the four angels on the four corners of the earth. Each of them would feed in a jet stream of air into the dome a bit like a leaf blower to cross ventilate the entire earth. Jet streams wouldn't work on a ball shaped earth because they'd fizzle out to nothing very quickly. The only way I can visualize a jet stream working is to feed that jet stream somehow into the system by an inlet. It's impossible to replicate a, a constant fast flowing column of air on a ball earth without something feeding that air into the system. Scientists will try and make out the case that hot and cold air colliding will cause a jet stream, but I think that's unlikely. So that brings us to the number one reason, and that is mathematics. Uh, in Psalm 147 verse 5, it's referring uh, to the Almighty, it says, His understanding is infinite. And... If we get to Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven, singular, and the earth. 
What you're about to see is approximately 20 seconds of complicated stuff. Just follow along as best you can here for 20 seconds because this will knock your socks off. In Hebrew, the first sentence of the Bible looks like this. If you take the number of Hebrew letters and times that by the product of the letters and then divide that by the number of words times the product of the words, you get 3.1416. The va that's the value of pi to four decimal places. Pi is the relationship of a circle's circumference to its diameter, so you measure the circumference of any circle all the way round and divide that by the diameter straight across, and you get 3.14, the value of pi, an infinite string of numbers. OK, that's the complicated stuff over. What the Bible is describing here is clearly a circle and not a sphere. And only... A flat geostationary circular Earth fits that description. And if that failed to knock your socks off, then you've not been paying attention. Because what we've got here is the Bible describing the creation of the Earth in words, and behind those words we've got a mathematical formula that not only verifies the authenticity of the text, a fingerprint of God if you will, but it describes the very shape of the Earth, circular. In the future I might post a video just on this subject alone, or I might write a book on the subject, or I might correspond with and collaborate with people who care. Uh, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. And finally, Luke 18 verse 17, For nothing is hid that shall not be made manifest, nor anything secret that shall not be known and come to light. All are architects of fate, working in these walls of time, some with massive deeds and great, some with less rhyme. Longfellow, the builders. Along the transcendent corridors of creative reality, architects of fate have made timely contribution to an interpretation of the expansive creation. Each architect contributed in the particular measure decreed by fate and time. Copernicus. Halley, Kepler, Galileo, Huygens, Newton, Herschel, Laplace, and others in the lengthy roster of times workers assisted in the perfecting of a conceptual mechanism which explained the conditions and events, seeming or factual, projected on life screen by surpassing creative function. Yet despite the best application of times workers, the reality remained obscure, and the most precise mathematical systems fail to embrace sublime cosmic reality. It is true that their artists redeveloped the materialistic system, which provided plausible and acceptable explanation of the appearance of celestial things and conditions. But the mysteries of the cosmos remained as mysterious as ever. Through the forceful dictates of fate and time, the systems evolved accomplished no greater knowledge of the creation's values. They only extended the spacious lawns and gardens of assumption to dignify man's prison of terrestrial isolation. The terrestrial remained a prison in spite of the architectural enterprise. The monumental man-made mechanistic universe has throughout the years been embellished by all manner of astronomical findings. And, 
though the things and conditions comprising such findings were of the illusory popular concept has attributed to them the value of creative reality theories lawns and gardens have been so enlarged during the past 400 years that casual observers have lost sight of the fact that they obscure a terrestrial prison the progress of the centuries has been that of enlarging and beautifying a heathen god image which might be expected to develop godly attributes in the process such being the case the centuries of magnified glamour for the decorative mathematical formulas may have led one to believe in the reality of the mechanistic systems which disintegrate the cosmos and isolate the earth the fables of that decorative scheme have become so firmly established that they are considered to represent factual elements of the creative pattern. Hence there may again be expressed the thoughtlessness of a certain charming but misguided lady of other years who attended the author's lecture account of celestial reality. At the lecture's close, she artlessly exclaimed, Oh, I do not like you. You take away my stars. How could the stars of that dear lady, and of all the dear and charming ladies of this universe, be taken away, except by divine decree of the sublime creative force which originally ordained their resplendent but beguiling placement? Such meaningless plant is akin to the unexpected utterance of one who had long prayed to be a mother and who, in observing delivery of the infant for which she had prayed, might cry out to the obstetrician, Oh, I do not like you. You have taken away my stork. You have destroyed the value of my childhood dolls. Would one expect that mother to renounce and condemn the medium whereby the reality she prayed for was brought to light? Could she be expected to decry the living image holding reality for all the illusions that could be crammed into human consciousness? The tangible and the real is sought from earliest childhood. Every activity is directed toward the acquisition of knowledge which discloses new facts of the immediate world in which we dwell. And who would have it otherwise? Has the beneficent light and warmth of the sun been depreciated through acquisition of knowledge as to the manner in which that light and warmth is generated and dispensed? Has the golden sunshine diffused from our immediate sky, wherever one might well become less golden because recent stratosphere observations disclose that the sun is red, rather than of golden luminosity, when observed against stratosphere darkness? Are dreams to be considered less than dream through knowledge of the causes and the possible portent of dreams? Would thought be detracted from if we were to become cognizant of the precise order and movement of a single thought vibration within the human brain? Could it be possible to consider blood less than blood if and when we acquire precise knowledge of its composition and are thereby enabled to reproduce it in laboratory endeavor? No, dear lady, nothing has been taken away. Your stars will continue to shine in the six magnitudes of their original classification, according to brightness, by the ancient gentleman named Hipparchus. And they will continue to be observed unto the 21st magnitude by the modern gentlemen with lenses who are known as astronomers. The only thing to undergo change will be adult understanding of star value and the only thing to be taken away will be the purposeless illusion of yesteryear. And though your interpretation of all such points of celestial skylight becomes more articulate, you will never be denied pleasure of the continuing illusory appearance of your little stars that seem to wink and blink at you and hold stealthy rendezvous in the stillness of the night. The so-called stars above will remain to all observation but their true character will be known. And their previous star value will exist in a way comparable to the manner in which animals and objects existed without body proportion for the undeveloped child mind. The minds of children not old enough to have acquired a third dimension concept of mass or body property cannot perceive the fullness of animals and objects. 
Hence the animal or object must be drawn without body fullness. And all efforts to reproduce the animal or object of three dimensions, length, width, and thickness, permit of nothing more than the lines showing the animal or object on a two-dimensional plane. Without concept of the body thickness of animal and objects, the child cannot express what concept does not hold. As the child grows older, it develops three-dimensional plane. Without concept of the body thickness of animals and objects, the child cannot express what concept does not hold. As the child grows older, it develops three-dimensional concept of things. It realizes that the animals and objects have body for, or fullness. Then it is able to reproduce the animal or object as it is rather than as it at first seemed to be to the undeveloped child mind. Strange as it may seem to members of our enlightened modern society, there are entire tribes in remote and uncultivated areas of the earth whose members are incapable of depicting objects and animals of three dimensions. They, too, are obliged to draw the animal or object without body fullness. Thus, would on consider that the child had lost or gained through that measure of mental growth enabling it to perceive the reality of things and conditions as they exist in a world of three dimensions? Could the devotal parent or the conscientious teacher be expected to decry the child's mental development? Would the particular animal or object become less real to the advancing child intelligence? The answers are most obvious. Nothing was subtracted from the child's mind and the measure of amusement derived from drawing the animals and objects. Nor was anything taken away from the animal or object and the drawings thereof. On the contrary, there was considerable of lasting value added for the child, for the animals and objects, and for the drawings. Therefore, the child mind acquired the realistic value of things. In like manner will there develop general advancement through discernment of the factual value of celestial lights. In the deeper astro-mathematical endeavor, they will continue to be telescopically observed the so-called stars of brilliancy to the 21st magnitude. And star light intensity will continue to be observed as varying from time to time and from place to place. That will apply to the terrestrial as well as the celestial. Such conditions will endure for the lenses and the numerous other deceptions for which the lenses are responsible will not be ended as far as observation is concerned. But the brain will know the reality behind the deceptions. Celestial observation and study will be advanced through observation of terrestrial skylight from newly acquired celestial land points of observation. But the study will continue to hold the apparent features of present astronomical study of the celestial and the apparent conditions must endure despite the fact that rocket camera photographs have proved such features to be just as apparent in terrestrial skylight areas. In no way will the presently observable celestial pattern be changed. But its multiple manifestations will be understood for what they are, rather than what they seem to be and the mental portrait acquired of universe reality will transcend the mechanistic vista evolved from deceptive appearances which previously obscured reality. The intriguing cosmic arrangement will, to observation, continue to contain the giants and the dwarfs of astronomy's elaborate star cataloging. The numerous galaxies will persist in the telescopically observable pattern of the cosmic whole whether observations be from the terrestrial of the celestial. But their meaning will be known. And the meaning will express something in a realm of cosmic reality where all of yesteryear's illusions accepted as fact will be known as illusion then will better equipped architects of fate accurately read the sky-like prints of the master builder's universe construction. The present so-called heavens above will continue to hold all the current guidance expressed by astrology, 
for knowledge of the movement of celestial skylight will not change the movement and the uplifting influences will remain for men and women who believe in the value of the positions of their celestial light guides. The spiritual uplift and moral guidance will be the same even through the presently assumed ascendancy of a particular luminous celestial area is conclusively established as nothing more than the undulating motion of luminous sky gas over an unobservable celestial land mass. It is the measure of belief and the depth of faith in a condition or thing, rather than the property of the condition or thing, which develop the inspiration and the rosy outlook we all require in the journey through this veil of tears. Hence in the ultimate it makes little or no difference how the uplift and guidance is acquired. The art of astrology will retain its star symbols. Their movements, real or fancied, need not be discarded. And whatever the extent of human enlightenment may be, knowledge will not detract from the favorable influences accredited to, and forthcoming from, individual actions at the times considered to be most opportune. In another realm of terrestrial human relations, the concept of theological heaven can endure for the religious multitude. The most skeptical cannot successfully challenge the theological premise that the unknowable infinity contains a departed spirit abode. And, in being such, it can be expected to defeat any application of abstract mathematics seeking to determine or negate heaven's existence. When it is fully realized that the vast astronomical resources, with unlimited scope of operation for probing the universe about us, fail in detecting and establishing realistic values of the universe, it will become manifest that fathoming of a more elusive spirit domain is beyond the ability of astronomy. And it would make no difference if the spirit domain were within or beyond the physical universe. Moreover, were such a utopian haven to exist within the realistic universe, and were it to be nightly viewed and measured by all of astronomy's mighty instruments, how could its identity be established? Would the spirits tell the astronomers, or would God tell them? Could the flaunted astronomical mechanics, which are proved impotent to detect celestial land mass or to differentiate between seeming and factual sky gas motions, be expected to penetrate into and determine an eternal celestial homestead for human spirits departed? And how could it be known as such even though it might? in some inconceivable magic manner, be embraced by mortal man's instruments of detection? Further, which of man's great instruments could be expected to determine that the spirits detected in an obscure spirit domain were in fact heavenly spirits? What could be the precise astro-mathematical formula providing the standard of measurement for spirits heavenly and spirits unheavenly? Heaven, theological heaven, which is not the so-called heavens above, could be anywhere within the constructed physical universe, so far as any abstract science is concerned. What abstract science, or what positive science, is capable of contradicting the conjecture that on some land mass area of the universe whole, and an area that is not embraced by dogmatic heaven, there now dwell human beings possessed of wings, when we consider astronomy's absurd assumptions, which obscure and deny the reality and life of the universe, what strangeness could possibly attach to the assumption that living men and women of other universe areas are endowed with wings? There is nothing strange about it, when we consider that any number of inferior animals of so-called prehistoric times are portrayed with wings, even though they were never seen by men. Who is to determine that the age-old desire of terrestrial man to fly stemmed in its entirety from the ever-present example and influence of birds in flight? Could there not have been retained within man the instinctive knowledge of having flown at an earlier period of his development? Further, could not the presently developed terrestrial man, prior to his terrestrial residence, have had wings suitable for a former residence somewhere on the celestial? Surely it is just as easy to ordain men with wings as to conjecture them with tails, 
even though tales might be considered more appropriate for some. Further, what mortal eloquence of reasoning can convincingly deny the existence of a celestial area inhabited by, and restricted to, formless spirits that cannot be seen? As such spirit cannot be seen, human mind could not discern their presence even though terrestrial men were to trespass on such celestial area of spirit domain and move among the formless spirit residents. Can we, of physical substance and form, see the radio image of substance during the period when it is transformed into energy and motion? Can we detect it before it is received and reproduced as substance image by the receiving apparatus we have constructed especially for the energy reception and its transformation into an image of the original substance? And, though our receiving and transforming equipment be most magnificent, can we detect, receive, and transform the energy unless there is proper reception, or attunement? Can we decipher the telephonic vibrations in transit and before they reach the receiver adjusted for their reception? Can we intercept the brain's functional magnetic vibrations before they are registered as waves on the recording chart of our own making? And even after their recording, can we decipher their vibrative messages in physical terms? These forces at work are within the unquestioned realistic realm of human physical expression. They represent the elements of and from man, and of which man has daily experience. Yet man, as creating power behind such forces at work, with the possible exception of the brain's function, lacks complete mastery of those forces directly at hand and under man's constant supervision. Therefore, what is the possibility of scientific determination of spirit vibrations which are without conformance to any man-made recorder? And the possibility becomes more remote if we grant the astronomical distances involved to be real. This treatment of spirit may seem to conflict with previous mention of a living person's observation of a moving luminescent spirit proceeding in the darkness away from a human body where all vital functions had just ceased. However, there can be no conflict. The spirit seen as an individual spirit must lose its individuality as it merges with all spirits in the unknown spirit world then it may defeat mortal ability to see it again as the individual spirit as it took flight from the body it had sustained for one or one hundred years. Like the individual cell which is lost to view by the ensuing multiplication of cells constructing the human body, the individual spirit must be lost to view in its emergence with the countless spirits making the eternal spirit world. After all, it was the unseen spree which actuated the original cell to build the body. Without it, there would have been no body. And the spirit, which actuated the original cell to build the body, remained the actuating force of that particular body until the spirit was ready to depart. Such condition is life. It should be manifest to all even if there were not a single religious utterance attempting description of man's eternal spirit. However, in spite of the individual spirit smirglance with other spirits after it has performed its task in the individual body, it may at times reassert individuality and take flight from the domain of collective spirits departed. That is a very pleasing conjecture, and there is no authority to deny the possibility. In such case, the individual spirit may again be seen by selected human beings to whom the spirit manifests its presence. The following simple example may more adequately describe. As living individuals, with body and spirit, we are permitted to see neuron activity of the body's nervous system. It is seen through the experienced twitching of a single nerve but we are denied seeing the accumulation of body neurons which comprise the body's nervous system. Hence the departing single, or individual, body spirit at the time of departure from the body may here be considered analogous to the single nerve's observable twitching. That individual spirit's completion of flight from the body, making for its emergence with all the spirit world, 
would afford it corresponding status in the unseen accumulation of neurons in the living body's nervous system. It would thereby become invulnerable to the sight of any living person. However, even though it were obliged to remain merged with other spirits of the spirit world, it could express unseen spirit individuality by manifesting its spirit presence to the spirit of a particular living person. Thus would spirit manifestations, unseen, develop for the person's subconscious, which would in turn alert consciousness to that spirit's presence. And the spirit presence, though unseen, would be most real. The living person's entire nervous system would feel it and the effect of the living person's spirit attunement to the departed spirit's presence would penetrate to the outer layer of the person's skin. There are many who have known such spirit attunement, and have experienced its reaction on the flesh and the skin. Hence it should not be too difficult to discern that the greatest possible physical advance into land areas of the so-called heavens above can never involve trespass on the territory of heaven, wherever it may be though the so-called heavens above are everywhere. Heaven must always be a restricted domain where living beings are denied entrance. Were it otherwise, heaven would cease to be heaven. And it is no doubt the only area where there is no necessity for the luminous skylight to express stars shining above. The splendor of heaven would have to be too magnificent for detection by lenses and their lensmen or it could not be heaven. It would have to transcend mortal concept. And it does. Fifty long and tumultuous years ago, in that burdenless childhood of folklore and fables holding the enchantment of twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, a sensitive child asked his beautiful first lady of life, mother, how far is the sky? And the beautiful first lady, to whom this book is appropriately dedicated, responded, Darling, the sky is millions of miles away. Memory of her loving response provokes the question, can anyone believe that the measure of enchantment held in childish vista of an unknown sky million miles away can compare with the fascination held in adult knowledge of the sky's propinquity at ten miles? Can the enchantment of distance, which served childhood, compare with adult comprehension of the sky's godly ordained purpose of providing unfailing protection for all life and vegetation on land underlying that sky throughout the universe whole? What possible loss could the child sustain through a realization that the million mile distance was untrue, and that the appearance of great distance to the sky was an illusion? Nothing could be taken away, because nothing real had existed. And, in this particular instance, considerable is gained through understanding of the sky's propinquity and its marvelous life-saving purpose and function. By the same token, what loss could be sustained from understanding that the myriad celestial lights are of the same gaseous content as the terrestrial sky, and that they express the same degree of brilliancy, and that they perform the same motions as our terrestrial sky's luminous outer surface, and who could be hurt through knowledge that the light from terrestrial sky area must express to celestial observers the same heavens above which celestial lights present to observers dwelling on this terrestrial area. Though every living person possessed complete understanding of celestial reality, would not such luminous celestial areas continue to transmit the present illusory star messages? We must not lose sight of the fact that up is always relative. Up is everywhere. Hence present residents of the terrestrial will in future years dwell on land underlying what is now considered a star. Then, in looking up or out from the celestial land area, they will observe terrestrial sky areas as stars and planets. And would not a future residents of celestial areas speak of the collected luminous terrestrial sky areas as the heavens above? The appearances, and the description of such appearances, will continue to be the same in spite of the fact that knowledge of the illusion will be positive. 
it will be known that every point of terrestrial skylight is only deceptively globular, and therefore only apparently isolated. Hence the words of illusion will endure though knowledge is had that they applied only to the illusory. They will have extended life in the manner that the fable of the stork is afforded expression by adults who know that the stork's delivery of babies is pure fiction. Does not adult intelligence enjoy the most far-fetched fiction and the most impossible, but temporarily intriguing, cinema productions, even though complete awareness is had that conditions described by books or cinema's area beyond the bounds of reality? Hence would the utmost knowledge of celestial values cause the stars, as they are now seen, to appear less than what they now appear to be? Would they at hold greater value as known star illusions than as the unknown illusions of the centuries? The moon would not be less moon were it universally known that the area of luminosity, greater than the luminosity of other celestial areas, is but a reflection of the sun at various angles at different periods. And it will not detract from the moon and its purpose when it is known that the reflection is not cast upon an isolated moon, body much closer to the earth and other celestial areas, but that the reflection is in fact cast upon an area of the luminous connected celestial sky. Would not the moon continue to shine? And would it not continue to inspire all the poetic description of your? Would not the harvest moon of tomorrow as of yesteryear parade in regal splendor along its full dress course of autumn nights? And would it not bring to pleasing fruition the bountiful crops and other joys of harvest moon and harvest nights? Would not the symbolic crescent moon persist? and merit all the time-worn description of oriental intrigue. And how dismal the soul would be of one who could not be transported on the crescent moon to faraway desert sands and tents, where nearby harem's passions gild the oriental crescent moon with tone of fiery red. Would not all that apply, whatever the moon may be in a world of reality? And, in that world of reality, the moon is very definitely not an isolated body. The author, who 50 years ago questioned his mother, recently directed the same question to a youth who was intently observing the nightly drama of celestial skylight. He asked, Son, how far away do you think the sky is? And the youth responded, The sky is gillions and gillions of miles away gillions and gillions of miles away. As there are no gillions of which the youth spoke, there exists no isolated moon body of which older children speak. Nor do there exist anywhere in the created universe hall the isolated star or planet bodies of which astronomers speak. They are no less conditions of a world of illusion than the sky's seeming distance to the undiscerning youth to whom the sky appeared beyond estimate of distance. So again the question is presented, what loss could that youth have suffered when he subsequently learned that there are no gillions of anything and that the seemingly distant sky is only ten miles from the Earth's surface? Likewise, what loss could be known by all the Earth's children through extension of knowledge that stars are deceptively appearing globular and isolated areas of a continuous and unbroken luminous outer sky surface? And would there not develop a measure of spiritual uplift from knowledge that such sky protectively covers every foot of the celestial land in the same manner as it protects all terrestrial land and life? And what too would be sustained by learning that the universal sky light, of varying brilliancy, only seems to twinkle or blink for the substantial reasons described in previous chapters? Despite the acquisition of such corrective knowledge, today's children grown will in tomorrow's expanding horizons continue to look out from terrestrial positions to view the resplendent so-called heavens above. And they, too, will mention their favorite twinkling stars. And their view, and the description of that view, 
will remain the knowledge with envy had that former terrestrial residents are living on the land mass underlying the celestial sky area to be seen from terrestrial observation as a twinkling star. Therefore, the undiscerning lady lecture attendant may take comfort in the knowledge that nobody and the known force can take away her stars. The astrologers and their followers, and all zealous star dash gazers everywhere, may know that their stars will endure as long as the universe and its life continue. If the creative force arranging the universal sky light, which permits star patterns to be seen for the reasons they are seen, were to cause discontinuance of the sky and its light, there could then be no mortal eyes to behold that the stars were gone. For without protective celestial and terrestrial sky density to produce the light which provides the star appearance, there would then cease to be any semblance of life on earth or on the universe about us. For astronomy in its elaborate mechanistic system, the north star and every presently charted celestial sky light point comprising the astronomers star charts will remain to observation and they will suffer no disturbance whatever other than that of having added to them, through human understanding, their natural underlying and long denied land mass. And it will then be understood that the underlying land mass is productive of abundant vegetation, and that it sustains human and other animal life. No, the stars are not to be taken away by man's immediate conquest of celestial land areas which the so-called stars, as areas of celestial sky light, so competently protect and hide. The religions and their devout members will continue to retain their luminous symbols as the Star of David, or the Star of Bethlehem. The presently observed celestial and terrestrial sky light appearances will endure as long as the protective universal sky remains an aspect of God's great miracle and serves as that master builder's universe roof. The past quarter of a century's naval research and exploration has proved the disclosures first made in the presence of the Boston Cardinal of 1927. It confirms that the so-called heavens above are to be observed from any location of the universal whole. However, Though a thousand polar expeditions penetrate a million miles and more into the interior of the heavens above, there will be no disruption of the presently observable celestial pattern. The observations will forever remain as they are. But journeys into the universe about us will provide belated knowledge of cosmic reality, and that knowledge will inspire a greater faith in the master builder responsible for the universe structure. Then will it be known that the unique master builder always deals in realistic force and substance which permit no place for the cosmic phantoms of astro-mathematical deduction. The kingdom of the heavens above, though not of heaven, is at hand, where it has always been. We just didn't know it. And the now clearly defined and most convenient land courses into the realistic celestial lands extend straight ahead from either supposed end of the known Earth. They are the land highways discovered beyond the South Pole point of theory on the memorable date of December 12, 1928, and beyond the North Pole point of theory in February 1947. During the period of this book's compilation, Rear Admiral Richard Evelyn Byrd publicly announced his intention to return for exploration of the millions of square miles of land embraced by the 1928 estimate of a 5,000 mile land extent beyond the South Pole point. Since that announcement a U.S. Naval Air Unit penetrated miles of the land extent they estimated. Yet only a brief mention was made of that surpassing accomplishment of January 13, 1956. As previously explained, it should be realized that the 1928 estimate of land extent constitutes only an elementary evaluation. The 5,000 miles is the greatest possible length estimate until a new estimating point is established at the 5,000 mile location. 
Then another 5,000 mile estimate of land length will be made. And that process of estimating and penetrating to the estimated length will continue for any number of years depending upon the speed of penetration into worlds beyond the poles. But by the time naval polar expedition of the United States and other nations reach the end of that 5,000 mile estimated extent, they will be found the race of men who are presently unknown to this earth. They also have lacked knowledge of their land's extension into the terrestrial area, and they have made no attempt to penetrate the forbidding ice and storm barrier of the terrestrial southern polar area. Their relation to terrestrial inhabitants corresponds to our pioneering European ancestors' relation to the American Indian. The American Indian of the 15th century was also without knowledge that the water of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans was the course to another world. The American Indian was as ignorant of the existing Old World as our European ancestors were of the Indian's New World. Moreover, the seeming meeting of the sky with the water was as real for the New World Indian as it was for the 15th century European. Hence the Indian could not have been expected to attempt penetration into a land which was beyond his concept. And he, too, was afraid of falling over the edge of the earth and being lost in space. The International Polar Expeditions of 1957-58 to 58 may have penetrated to the estimated 5,000 mile extent beyond the South Pole. As progress is continued beyond that point there will be found the numerous racial groups characteristic of this terrestrial area's population. White men will dwell in one area. Black men will live in another area. Yellow men will greet explorers in a land area farther beyond. Brown and copper colored men will be found to inhibit other areas. All the known changes in climatic conditions common to terrestrial areas will be found to prevail throughout the land areas containing the various racial groups of worlds beyond the poles. And every area of the land beyond is a spacious highway of the so-called heavens above. For, as the illustrative flywheel universe conveyed, the lowest angle in progress beyond either terrestrial pole point bears the relation of being up from terrestrial level. Study of that figure one will show that any area of the flywheel beyond the designated terrestrial pole points must, from observation anywhere between the two poles, appear to be up from the area embraced by the poles. Hence the discovered lands beyond the North Pole and the South Pole are not merely highways into the celestial, they are positive land areas of the celestial which makes the universe about us. And they represent connecting land courses to the particular land areas of the heavens above to be observed on the perpendicular, or directly overhead, from any land area of the terrestrial. The celestial areas having placements in the universe hall at an angle of only 5 degrees beyond terrestrial level are as much a part of the heavens above as the luminous celestial areas observed at an angle of 90 degrees. They are all connected areas of the continuous universe hall. The factual universe contour and the physical relation of the terrestrial to the celestial presence a truth stranger than the strangest fiction the minds of men have ever developed. But truth is supposed to be stranger than fiction. Welcome back to Insight. Right now, there are five different teams vying to be the first to balloon around the world. You've already heard about Bertrand Picard and his three-man crew. Well, among the others is Dick Rutan, the man who 11 years ago was the first person to pilot an airplane around the world, a plane called the Voyager. Rutan's balloon is called the Global Hilton. 
However, the main competition for Picard is expected to come from two multi-millionaires who love adventure and have big bank accounts. Jason Evans profiles them. When you have made as much money and been as successful in business as Richard Branson has, you begin to look for new challenges. For a decade now, ballooning has been just that for Richard Branson. Years of preparation and millions of dollars of his own money have gone into his effort to fly around the globe in the craft he calls the Virgin Global Challenger. And just a few days ago, it looked like Branson was on the brink of succeeding. The weather was perfect in Morocco as Branson's team began inflating the gigantic balloon that would carry him and his two crewmates. But the wind began to kick up and the balloon ripped from its moorings. In the end, it did what a helium balloon is supposed to. It floated away, except without the crew and capsule. In a nearby hotel room, Branson got the phone call that told him he would not fly that day. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Sorry? No, I'm not joking. The balloon has ripped from its uh, moorings and it's, and it's gone off alone. Nobody's hurt you. I'll, I'll come down there. <laughs> Bye. What's happened? The balloons. The wind got up and has taken the balloon away from its mooring. Thanks for my phone, Dan. Branson's private plane followed the balloon from Morocco to Algeria, where it finally came back to Earth in the desert. Branson talked about trying to lift off again in a few days if the balloon was not too badly damaged, but those hopes were dashed. The balloon had been dragged along the desert floor and might need to be replaced. That will probably delay Branson's effort until at least January, perhaps even February. You know, we've, we've been planning this for about 10 years. We did the Atlantic crossing, it, it took us two attempts. We did the Pacific crossing, it took us two attempts. Uh, this is our second attempt at the Transglobal. Um, obviously, we're, uh, we're, you know, we're, 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 we will keep trying until we succeed, uh, unless another team beats us to it. One of the men who could beat him to it is millionaire Chicago stockbroker Steve Fawcett. Unlike the other big efforts to fly a balloon around the world, Fawcett will not have a crew on board to help him. He will be flying solo and at a much lower altitude. But Fawcett knows what he's in for. A year ago, he came closer than anyone to making it around the globe when his balloon made it from St. Louis all the way to India before he ran out of fuel and had to land. Fawcett set a distance and endurance record in the attempt and says he's learned a lot from that failure. He expects to succeed this time. Once the weather gets better at his takeoff spot in the Midwestern United States, he should get his chance. Jason Evans, CNN reporting.